Hello everyone And hello from Mishka She's ready to learn a little bit about the Middle Ages So today I would like to show you one of the Christmas presents I got I think this is the first new CD I've got in probably over 10 years but from what I can tell, there's no vinyl, so I asked what a CD. I mentioned recently that I've been listening to medieval songs from Spain. And then the algorithm suggested some other medieval music. And eventually I heard some of these. Carmina Carolingiana, Chantipi Coton de Charlemagne. So songs from the time of Charlemagne and specifically I heard the first one versus the Bella che fui d'acta fontaneto the thing is I don't know any Latin I've had French but never Latin and I can sometimes um, identify individual words but when I just see a title like that, I have no idea what it means. And I just saw, hmm, Bella, probably something beautiful. When it was in December, they were chanting in Latin. There were some bells throughout, and I was like, oh, it's almost like Christmas music. Okay, it turns out it's not Christmas music at all. This is a really beautiful packaging. And the wonderful thing is, you guys so much information both the poems that are the basis of the songs and some additional information on the time of Charlemagne in both French and English and there's also the Latin text here the French translation and the English one. It starts off Aurora comprimo mane tetra noctem dividens Sabatum non illud vuit Sat Saturni dolium De fraterna rupta pace Gaudet daemon impius Maybe you already have an idea of what that could mean and that is not particularly joyful It says The dawn that is felt the horrendous night at the break of day was not a Sabbath of rest but a Saturday of sorrow The demon of disloyalty rejoiced in seeing the breach of peace between brothers So, very dramatic they cry war on all sides, violent fighting breaks out Brother schemes the death of brother, uncle of nephew The son shows no mercy to his father So the song talks about a war and specifically about a battle And it tells us who the winner was The right hand of the Lord Almighty has protected Lothair he won the battle through his courage in combat If the others had fought like him, peace would soon have been restored It also tells us where it happened They call it Fontenoy The fountain, as well as the village in the country where carnage and devastation of the blood of Franks took place So it was a battle between the Franks They fought on both sides we also know who wrote this poem This calamity that occurred, which my poem recalls I, Angelbert, witnessed it with my own eyes and fighting with my companions I was the sole survivor among many in the front line of battle And then he tells us who the enemies of Luther were 
I returned to see the deep valley and the gaping chasm where the brave King Wilda chased his fleeing enemies down the banks of the torrent. On the side of Charles, as well as that of Louis. Then he continues talking about the, the horrors of the battle. So the enemies were Charles and Louis. And we get another idea of who these three were. It says here, brother schemes the death of brother. So they were all related. And before we go back and look a bit more at the history of this poem, there's one small detail I want to show you in the Latin version. Have a look at the first words of each line. Aurora, Bella, Caedes, Dextera, Etze, Fontanetta, Gram, Hock, and so on. So it spells out the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, and so on. And I think that is a really funny little detail in such a gruesome poem. Anyway, so here we also get some information about Latin, the Carolingian era. And here we have some more information about the time and this poem in particular. So here we're given a date. This was June the 25th, 841, shortly after the death of Emperor Louis the Pious, successor to Charlemagne. A devastating war set the heir to the imperial title, Lothar, against both of his brother, Louis the Germanic and Charles the Bold. Alright, the kitty has uh, more important things to do. I think she's off to eat. So the battle, we already noticed, took place at Fontenoy. And it resulted in the Treaty of Redan, which left a deep-seated mark on the history of the European West. I'm going to show you this on a map in a minute. I think it's a really fascinating time. We also have here the alphabet from A to P. It's 15 stanzas and they're composed in three 15 syllable lines. So if we have another look back here. So we have here 15 syllables, a division, another 15 syllables division and the third set of 15 syllables and then the next line. And I think it makes for a really interesting uh, melody. It really caught my ear. I will link it below in the description box so you can listen to it. I think that's really beautiful. And the Versus has been preserved in three manuscripts and this is the Paris version because it has been supplied with an Aquitanian style musical notation. So oftentimes when you hear medieval music, I think inevitably the question that's going to come up is how do we know what it sounded like? Because they didn't write down notes like we do today with maybe these annotations, you know, forte, piano. So they added certain musical notations. If you look at it here, they introduced a system of musical notation with signs that mimic the rising and falling inflections of the singing voice in the space about the lines. And that was less the notation of a melody 
but rather it helped to articulate a correct and easily understandable delivery of the text. So the text was really important when it came to the rendition of these songs. And I really like what it says here. So from then on, the masters managed to give unprecedented scope to the rights of the public and official liturgy, whose function was both sacramental as well as secular. In their great prose writings, they insert exuberant pieces of poetry, prosimetra that were probably meant to be read aloud and sung. They used this material for all the rites of public life and death in the churches and palaces where services are held. These public ceremonies must first and foremost be beautiful, luxurious, magnificent, thus they have to be enriched with musical creations, sequences, tropes, and other pieces more plainly supported by monodic chant or polyphonic singing. From then on, music ceased to be a mere embellishment. Mm -hmm. They turn into language, communication. Contemporaries expected it to be awe-inspiring and to help memorization. I think that's really beautiful. Okay, and before we look at the maps, just as a briefly yeah. want to show you these photos of the musicians. This was recorded at the Abbey of Fontefroux, which is a really, really beautiful place. And if you're ever um, near the Loire, it's definitely worth visiting. Okay, but we still want to know what was going on with those three brothers. Have a look here at the Putzke Historische Weltatlas. And we can see here the Empire of the Franks under Charlemagne. So we're back around the year 800. And you have to remember, after the Roman Empire in the West fell, there wasn't that much happening here. Of course, you have a lot of medieval history, but this was more the periphery. And the center of history moved east, towards East Rome, Constantinople. It moved south. We can see here the Emirates of Cordoba. And here in the north, we have the Vikings, also moving east with the Kievan Rus. So you have here sort of the centers surrounding Western Europe, and this was a bit more calm. There was still the idea of Rome as an empire, as a great a source of power, but the level of education had fallen a bit, and Latin was still spoken, but in a different form. So this was more vocal Latin, the everyday kind of Latin that was starting to develop into different dialects and would eventually become French, Spanish, Italian, etc. One thing we've already mentioned in the video about the French language, you probably remember this, is that while French is a Romance language, so it developed out of Latin, the rulers were Germanic during that time. And Charlemagne probably spoke Frankish, which is a Germanic language, and not so much Latin, so there are comments that he learned Latin and he could even read it and he spoke it as if it were his mother tongue. I don't know if that's a bit of an embellishment because obviously he was an important ruler and 
you only want to say the best of things about your emperor, right? All right. We can also see the Bretagne here is not part of the empire of the Carolingians. But we can see that it extends eastwards across what would become Germany eventually. We have some areas here that would become Austria. And Charlemagne also ruled over parts of Italy. And that is a huge area. Now the problem is, after Charlemagne, this empire started to break apart. And with the Franks, the rule was that you would divide the land between your sons. So, the son of Charlemagne was Louis, and Louis had three sons. So he divided it into three parts. And we already know these three sons, Lothair, Louis and Charles. We're gonna switch to a different book because I think it gives us a better map of what happened then. This is this is the Atlas der Weltgeschichte. And here we can see the division of the Empire of Charlemagne. So, Lothair, the winner of the battle at Fontenot, ruled the middle part of the empire. So we have here Frisia at the north, we have here Verdun, where they came together to sign the treaty. We have the Rhone here with Lyon. Provence down in the south. And then here across the Alps, here's Basel, Strasbourg. Up towards the North Sea again. Initially, this also included the Italian part of the kingdom, but this eventually fell away. Now, you might think that it's not really the best part of the empire, right? It's a really long uh, and narrow land, plus you have the Alps cut across it, which makes it very difficult to rule. And in fact, it broke apart eventually. But Lothair didn't just rule over this land. He also got the title of emperor. And he also had nominal overlordship of the other lands. So this was still altogether the Carolingian Empire. And Lothair was the ruler. So, to anyone outside, this looked like a unified area. Inside, you had three rulers with different uh, laws, etc. Okay, east of the Rhine, with Saxony, Alemannia, eventually also Bavaria and Carinthia, we have the area of Louis the German. And on the other side, with Aquitaine, we have the Empire of Charles II. Gascogne here, Gazette, Bretagne, all separate. And I think you can already see how this shaped the development of Western Europe over the centuries. This is an easy area to rule, relatively speaking. You can travel through it, it gives you plenty of land, and this would eventually develop into France. 
on the other side, you have an area that would eventually become the Kingdom of Germany in the Middle Ages and then the German state today, with Bavaria having a bit of a special role throughout. But in the center, like I said, this broke apart. In fact, during the 9th century, you had four partitions of the Carolingian Empire. So the Treaty of Verdun was only the first one. Here in the north, you have what's today the Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg, sovereign states. In the center, here with Strasbourg, Metz, you have Alsace and Lorraine, which would switch between Germany and France over the centuries. Not today part of France, but you still find a lot of people who speak German or the local dialects. Here we then have Switzerland, which is kind of went its own way. And here we have Burgundy which would become quite important also with regards to the history of the Habsburgs. From here began the expansion across the Netherlands, Spain, and then into the New World. But Burgundy too sort of changed rulers over time. When I say they were ruled by the Habsburgs, this already gives you an idea that it was not part of the Kingdom of Germany and not under the rule of the King of France. You can see this really well here with the different treaties throughout the 9th century. 843, 870 and then again 879, 880. So here we have the Kingdom of Luther in yellow at the centre. It then turns only into the southern part of Italy and the northern part is divided between the eastern and western kingdoms and eventually Burgundy is separated from it as well. And I always have to think of my history teacher who basically said, because this was such an, a strange creation, it kind of only could fall apart. There was no way this could develop into one country. He might have simplified a bit, obviously, so we had a better understanding of it. But that really stuck with me. I find it quite fascinating. Mm. Okay, I think the kitty is taking some interest again as well. Mm. Mm. And we also have here the area where the battle happened. And unfortunately, Fontefort, which I've mentioned earlier, is not on this map, but it would also be here in this region the region of Anjou and one small detail it's a beautiful abbey and what you find there are the Plantagenet kings they were laid to rest in this abbey so there's a connection to the history of England as well so plenty of things to uh, explore and to discover in this chant here versus the pelle che fui d'acta fontaneto I haven't been able to find any information on this Angilbert who wrote down the poem though there was an Angilbert um, at the court of Charlemagne as well who had children with one of the daughters 
of Charlemagne. But he passed in 814 and the Anga that we're looking at here passed obviously after 841. Alright, like I said, I'll link the song in the description box. Maybe you'll enjoy it as much as I did. And I think now we need to give this little kitty here some attention. Thank you for joining me today. And I'll see you again next week. Good night. Mm-hmm.